Hey, good to be with you again. You know, this time in so many ways feels like what I want to call an after time. I don't know about you. You know, it's that moment after something happens when it's finished, but you're not quite over it. You're not quite recovered. You don't feel ready to go back to normal yet. It's like you're in limbo on pause. You're still processing, still thinking still reacting, still a little bit thrown by everything that happened. When stressful or traumatic stuff hits us, you know, bereavement, grief, pain, or, or just change, dramatic change like we've been through in the last year, it changes us. It changes the way we act and react and interact with the world, with people around us. It changes our friendships, our relationships. It changes some of the foundations of who we are. And it's natural in those moments to find yourself asking, you know, am I now different? Why don't I feel like myself? Is there something wrong with me? After all, we can be quick to assume that people have changed when we see this happen in these after moments. You know, there's a famous story that occurs in the weeks after Jesus had died and been resurrected, and he appears to the bunch of the disciples, but one of them isn't there, it's Thomas. And, and Thomas hears about it after and he just can't comprehend what they're saying. He wants his own experience before he can take that leap of faith to trust in it entirely. In, in fact, in, in my mind, it's like this moment of slightly over-emotional, almost teenage exaggeration. He says, unless he literally puts his hand in the wounds, he won't believe it. Now, John 20 tells us what happens after that, when Jesus appears next and Thomas is there and, and Jesus kind of calls his bluff. He says, go on then, put your hands in the wounds. That's what you wanted. And, and you know, there's nothing in the account to suggest that that's actually what Thomas did. It, it's like he just doesn't need to in that moment. He looks at Jesus and, and, and he just knows that in that moment, there's no question. His need for proof is gone. It's, it's an instinctive gut level faith and he just cries out, my Lord and my God. That's a cry of his heart, not his intellect. That's his passion. That's, that's a different type of faith. And, and, you know, of course, Thomas is famously known as Doubting Thomas. This, well, the first of those two incidents wins him this dubious honour for like the rest of all time of being uh, applied this label that links him to doubt. But Thomas wasn't always like that. In fact, there are stories in the New Testament of him being daring, brave, full of faith, and, and the only one of the disciples to be like that. You know, there's this story in John 16 of something that happens just, just before the Easter events, and, and Jesus wants to go to Bethany, which is quite near Jerusalem, to go to his friend Lazarus, who is gravely ill, and, and they all know it's dangerous. It's like the other disciples are trying to put him off. They're reminding him that last time he got stoned. They're saying, hey, Lazarus is going to be fine. I'm sure he won't need you to go. I'm sure he's going to recover. And, and it's Thomas who's the one who stands out because he says not just, no, no, let him go, let's go. But he says, we should all go and we should die with him if necessary. You know, he, he stands out in that moment for his courage and his faith. Not so doubting then. And this whole story makes me think, therefore, of two things. Firstly, it's about doubt. You know, what Jesus says to Thomas after he said, you know, my Lord, my God, is that he believes because he now sees with his mind. It's, it's a word that Jesus uses that, that basically implies that, that his brain has caught up with his being. Now he has rationally processed things. His mind has been able to do the ticking over that it needs to do. And, and it's that thing that I'm talking about so much at the moment because we all feel this need to process, like our brain are lagging behind you know the world may be feeling lots nor more normal but but we don't we feel like there's there's a big gulf between us and feeling back to our normal selves again and and Thomas too has been overwhelmed with what he's feeling and with what he's been through you know the, the shock the grief the loss and and then the change of direction of the story when suddenly things turn back to something that looks good, looks exciting, looks like it's about hope and promise and future when Jesus is resurrected. And, 
And it's like it's just too much for his mind to comprehend. And Thomas thinks what he needs is some kind of proof. He thinks this is a rational challenge, that nothing else could possibly resolve this and enable him to, to believe it, to stake his life on it, to dare to dream that this could be true. But actually, it's, it's a mental journey of processing that he needs to make. You know, some people are just thinkers. Are you? Uh, you probably know some people like that. Maybe you're one yourself. I'm guessing Thomas was someone with the kind of mind that, that is very agile, very constantly ticking, constantly thinking, constantly analysing. And, and those type of people, when life goes cr crazy, they tend to instinctively reach for fact, for analysis, for proof. If that's the way your mind works, when overwhelm hits you and actually your thinking, rationalising brain is turned down, you can't do that. You can't think things clearly. You can't join all the dots. You can't prove or understand everything. That's actually really tough. I love the Greek word, which is often used in the New Testament for doubt. And, and it comes from two words, actually. And, and the first is a word that means to waver between two things, to go back and forth between two options. And then the second word means to judge. So you're trying to make a judgment, but you're literally going back and forth between two things. We tend to think of faith and doubt as two binary states. You know, you either believe it or you don't. It's like different ends of a line. But this suggests that doubt is something much more dynamic. And, and it implies that there's something that happens when we're thrown and, and we get pushed into this place where we start to try to do something intellectually, to make this judgment that's based on rationality, that, that maybe we're trying to transform something that was designed to be more of an instinctive, heartfelt, God-given gift, a, a yearning, a reaching out for things that we can't see and can't prove. That instead what we do is we start to overthink because our anxiety has made us feel like we need something more. We need rational proof. Maybe we don't always need to be completely convinced. Maybe we don't always need to understand. The, the problem with trying to do faith that way is your mind can always pick holes in things. There are always going to be more questions when we're trying to talk and understand something as big and amazing as God. Maybe we need to recognise it's okay not to understand everything. There's this passage in James 1 and, and verse 6 in particular that uses that word for doubt to talk about what happens if we do try to do faith with this sort of intellectualising, this argument-based rationalising. And, and he says it, it means you believe one minute and you doubt the next, particularly in stormy seas, when your mind just isn't up to that kind of rationalising, so you can't do it well enough. He says you become like the rough seas, driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute and tossed down the next. And James carries on to say that when you're in that state, when your mind is in that much of a model, it's hard to take hold of anything from God. It's hard even to recognise God. The second thing that this passage about Thomas makes me reflect on, though, is just how much we need to learn to let people not be perfect. People around us, people we love, people we're in friendship and relationship with, but also ourselves. You know, we're so quick to judge, so quick to see ourselves acting in a way that, that seems unfamiliar or out of character or just a little bit irrational, a bit twitchy, a bit reactive in these tough times. And, and what we feel is just disappointment, let down. We wanted to be better people. We wanted to be more perfect. We feel let down by our own humanity, our own limitations, our own flaws and flimsiness in the face of this challenge, our emotionality, our losing control, not acting the way we normally would. And we judge ourselves and other people and we sort of apply labels like we're rubbish or we're not good enough or we're over emotional or we're stupid. When none of those things are true, we're just people in a storm. You know, Thomas, was both things. He was daring and he was doubtful. We all are. Daring, doubting, depends on the day. And that's okay, it's okay to be human. That's why we need each other. We need other people to lean on in the tough times. So go easy on yourself if you're finding trust and faith difficult right now. 
You know, life and the world in general is flipping complicated right now and your head probably has a lot to figure out from what's gone, from what is and what's coming. It's okay not to understand the bigger picture, God's dream, what God is doing in this, in the big things, but also in your little things. Not understanding doesn't mean you're wrong to believe. It doesn't mean you don't have faith. It doesn't mean you're failing. Instead, let's proactively nurture and foster that other type of faith that Thomas showed in the moment when Jesus stood before him, when his his brain was just pushed aside for a moment by his instinctive, gut-reaching, heartfelt love for God, his soul just crying out the way it did. Can we not let our panicked mind that struggles to to cling on to rationalising and understanding, not let it beat that back? and instead release our hearts to reach where they know they need to go, reaching out to God. You know, you might want to pause right in this moment and just let your mind do that, reach out to God. Not not your thinking mind. Your thinking brain, if it's anything like mine, is a little bit exhausted, a bit addled, a bit overwhelmed at the moment. So just pause. You might want to shut your eyes right now. You know, just let your frantic buzzing brilliant but slightly tired brain settle for a minute and and listen can can you feel that instinctive spiritual self inside you your heart that just yearns for God can you let it reach for him you know in the old testament this is Jeremiah 29 13 there's something that God says that I want to speak over us all right now So God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you. So Lord God, may you be found by all those searching right now and in the battle between heart and mind. I just pray that we might not feel swept away in a storm, clinging on to a rationality and an understanding that we can't complete in our humanity and in our limitation. Instead, Lord God, may our hearts be anchored by your love. And in these tough times, Lord, where we might not be feeling quite ourselves, we might not be responding the way we would hope to, Lord, give us the gift of seeing ourselves the way that you see us, through your grace and love and unconditional acceptance. I just ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.